Excited to talk to our next guest because he has a book that's coming out on the legendary Macho Man Randy Savage entitled Macho Man, The Untamed, Unbelievable Life of Randy Savage. The book is going to be hitting stores on April 2nd, which means you can pre-order that right now through Amazon and other places. We welcome in John Finkel. John, thank you so much for jumping on the show, man. Thank you guys for having me. I'm always pumped to talk macho. So let's just start there. You decide, okay, sitting down, writing a book. Why was uh, Macho Man Randy Savage the topic that you wanted to write about? Yeah, this is my uh, my tenth book actually. So I've done a lot. Most of my other books are more of the the mainstream sports variety. I did a biography of Charlie Ward, an autobiography with Mean Joe Green, books on the Supersonics with Nate Robinson, and so more mainstream you know, football, basketball, baseball type books. But my first love, probably as a fan of sports and entertainment, uh, was and is and has always been wrestling. And so I grew up a, a big, big John Studd fan, actually, when I was really little. I used, I used to call myself Little John Studd, running around the house and drawing <laughs> stars on my, my legs like his tights. And then when Macho came in, like millions and millions of us, I, I just became totally captivated with the, the voice and the phrases and the turns and the outfits and, and also the high-flying stuff. Like part of the reason, as I've been you know, talking about this book, I, I realized like one of the biggest draws to Macho was you could – get your little brother on the floor and do an elbow drop off your bed. You know, it was fun to do. It wasn't like the Hogan leg drop, no fun, you know, just a clothesline or a body slam is basic, but you could do the macho elbow flying off your bed or flying off the couch and put your brother on a beanbag or something and, and really live macho man. So, so from that point on, I always wanted to, 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 to write a book about macho. Once I realized I was, I wanted to be an author and, and it was just sitting there and thankfully no one did it. And I got the opportunity to do so. You're a respected journalist. Obviously, when you're finding out these stories, you got to double check, you got to triple check things. What's the craziest story that you found out? And you're like, that can't be true. Like, can I actually put that in there? What was that one story that sticks out for you? Yeah, there's a story um, about Macho Man before any of us had, had heard of him uh, when he used to work in the territories for, for the ICW, which was a company that he and his brother Lanny and his father Angelo founded, which is what used to be called the, the territories for, for people if they, they know all about that. Um, and there's a story where at the end of a night, uh, Randy's hungry and he goes with one of his fellow wrestlers, uh, Rip Rogers, to a, to a Waffle House. And they're not paying him enough attention because as he orders, another guy comes in who is a regular and is announcing that he's getting married. And Randy is getting annoyed with all the waitresses going up to talk to this guy. And he's sitting there and he's sitting there. And finally, when the guy says, oh, I want to do a toast, this is at a Waffle House, mind you. So who knows what the, the class and clientele this is like one in the morning or something. Randy turns around and goes, well, who gives a crap? And like everyone turns. They obviously all knew this guy who came in. He's a trucker on a shift or whatever. And what happened next? I did not believe until I found the police report. And I found the original articles after that in the local newspaper in, you know, 1975 macho and this guy went on an absolute brawl the guy ends up leaving after he leaves they can't settle macho man down so they bring in a police <laughs> unit that doesn't work they bring in a canine unit that doesn't work and it ended up taking like three clock cops two billy clubs and a german shepherd to bite his butt uh that actually subdued macho man and i did not believe this i'd heard the story on, on a podcast in the back in the day and I couldn't believe when I'm looking at this police report and reading the next day officers being interviewed, it was the wildest story you've ever heard. And it's true. It actually all happened. The quotes in the paper happened. The officers interviewed happened. The, the size of the canines incisors and, and the butt bite on Macho's butt happened. And he was like tased and maced. It was insane. And it's all real. So, I mean, obviously a book like this for a personality like Macho Man has to take a while. How long have you been working on this? Um, I, I probably, it was two full years. The proposal that I finally sold was about uh, 18 months ago. So from the time the, the proposal was sold, we had a publisher in, it was about 18 months. But before that, um, I had done a ton of research uh, on these kinds of stories and fleshing out his father's life, Angelo, and his life. Because um, at the time, I, it was really important to me to be able to have access to and interview his brother, Lanny Papa, who, who was alive then. And I wanted to make sure that when I was, and it took a while, but when I was finally able to introduce myself and connect, that I knew my stuff and that I knew um, you know, the, the real questions, not just the basic stuff that other people had probably asked and been denied before. I wanted to know the nitty gritty so that when, and, and luckily it took, like I said, it took about a year to get in touch with him, but when we finally had that conversation, 
I was prepared and I knew what I was talking about. So probably two, maybe even three years total, because it took a year from when I first started trying to get in touch with Lanny and wrote the proposal all the way to when we actually sold it and, and, and I got to talk to Lanny. So, you know, you could probably go back three years or so. So you tweet out, you're battling it out with the man right now. We'll admit we had her on this week also. But what is that <laughs> feeling like? You put in those years of work for this book and to see the reaction, and most people don't even have it in their hands yet. I have one here. But Thank to you. see that reaction, to see people buying it, what is that like? That feeling like right now? It's, it's the best. You know, it's like you write this book and anyone who's, who's even a writer at all or even kind of just works any kind of creative field, you spend so much of it by yourself. Um, you know, it's fun. You're researching and that's kind of what we do. And then the interviews, I did hundreds of interviews, his whole high school team, his whole little league team, his whole friends in his neighborhood, you know, extras on Spider-Man. I mean, the whole gamut of, you know, of people who, who are around this guy. And then you're finally at this point, uh, you know, like I said, you know, you signed the contract to write this book. And I think it was maybe September of 2022. And you just have it in your head like, all right, so WrestleMania 40 in the spring of 24 all right, I have a blank page. Let's get there. And, you know, I wrote other things in the meantime. You have your life and family and kids and coaching and a million real world things happen. And then all of a sudden you're here and it's awesome, dude. And it's like, you see stuff and, and people are like, you have the book or I've seen, I've had pictures of people with like that and Becky's book. And it's like, I, you know, Becky's you know, awesome. But you're like, <laughs> now you're like, and it's great because it's the man versus the macho man. And we've been dueling it out. Uh, I don't think we're going to touch what she had. I mean, <laughs> I don't have 5.2 million followers on Instagram and 10 million on, on Facebook or whatever she has. And I don't have the full weight of the WWE behind me pushing the book. However, um, it's nice that it's like the most frequently bought together. Uh, sure. It's nice that like a lot of people have said, like, I got my spring reading list together and they're holding up pictures, of, you know, holding our two books. Um, so it's very cool. And, and I like that, uh, you know, in another week when it's actually on the shelves, um, cause there's been a bit of a dearth of like wrestling books. Um, a couple of writers that I know, there a great biography. Ric Flair came out last year and another one of the original Sheik, but Brian Solomon came out. So there's been a few, but of those eighties guys, um, you know, this is kind of like the, the signature tentpole one, uh, biography. And so it's going to be cool when they're on the shelf together. And, you know, like you held it up the cover. I mean, I've dreamt of this exact cover from the minute I was like convincing my agent that we have to do this book. I was like, the cover think about this like he's in full macho man gear like bright yellow font purple background like a movie poster of this guy put that on the shelf next to any book let alone wrestling or sports or biographies and people will not be able to take their eyes off it just like they weren't able to take their eyes off of macho man himself with all the interviews you did what was one that kind of was was more helpful and more impactful than maybe you thought it would be going in yeah, the best one, I think your audience will appreciate it because of the kind of the age range of it. The very best interview I had was with somebody who was not on my radar at all when I started the book, which always happens. Every book, it's like the six best people you talk to, you never heard of or didn't think to talk to, like when you're putting your hundred people together first. But I ended up talking and having a great conversation with Mr. Wonderful Paul Ondorf's son, who, if you can put yourself in his shoes, he's like eight. His father is, you know, Mr. Wonderful, kiss your bicep, Paul Orndorff. <laughs> and after these shows, his dad, was, they were close. His dad took him around with him. He's getting on the tour bus. And in the back, it's, you know, Hulk Hogan and, and Andre the Giant playing cards. And on the left, it's Junkyard Dog and Tito Santana hanging out. And then, of course, Macho Man was a staple there, too. And just getting that perspective from a kid who was like us, but actually was had a front row seat to all this stuff of, of how these guys interacted and how Macho treated the other wrestlers and, and especially him as a kid. And that was the, the coolest thing to hear was that like, he said he was the only one who like saw me and like talked to me as a person uh, was Macho Man. And he was by far the most intimidating. And, you know, whenever the other kids used to be around, they used to mess with Macho and send them over to him. But he was always great with kids. And he did, uh, <laughs> he did the thing that every like guy does who maybe doesn't have kids with kids. He's like, uh, what's on your shirt there? And then did the nose thing, like, oh my God. <laughs> and, to this eight -year -old, and just the idea, thinking of that, like you're on this bus and he's probably eyes wide and there's all these behemoths and superstars. And he's like, oh, you got something there on your shirt. Like think of how, about how amazing that would be if your story is like for your goofy uncle or some random teacher and his story of that happening is with the macho man. <laughs> for you, when you talk about different things, what was it, in terms of like the love of Macho Man, what stuck out in terms of that and how everyone loved everything about Macho Man? 
Uh, the way I, I've seen it, and as I, as even as I was reaching it, because that was part of the book, was like the, the spine of the the book and and the ethos for me was like, how does you know how does a guy transform himself from you know a skinny guy named Randy Poffo trying to be a major league baseball player, which to me was the most fantastic like like fascinating part of his whole story. Anyway, was that that was his first forget like one foot in wrestling, one foot in baseball. Like that was his first love. Like he wanted to be a baseball player. So how he went from Randy Poffo to Randy Savage to the icon, you know, macho man and why he was so, so you know, transcendent to all of us. I think it was the package of the intensity, obviously the voice. He was the most unique wrestler by far of his era. He was, you know, in his era, he, he was, there was Macho Man, especially in the WWF, you, you could put Ric Flair there overall. But in the WWF, there was his promo work and then a couple notches down, you know, Hulkster was good, but not great with like the, the insults and the put downs. And, and, and Hulkster, what he brought the Hulkster and the intensity, the, 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 all that stuff. But Macho was smart. And one of the things that I did not know about him was, was how cerebral he was. You know, he, he was an honor roll student in high school. He loved playing chess. He loved playing poker. He was well read. Uh, he was smart. And so that translated into the promos. If you really listen, he references a lot of smart things. You know what I mean? Even as he's making fun of, you know, we all know the cup of coffee and the big time and all those things. But if you listen to some of the new reactions with me and Gene as an adult and you're not like in the moment of getting hype and you're just listening, you're like, that's really clever there's one one of my all-time favorites of his is uh he's interviewing mean gene's interviewing him and he like almost falls when he's twirling and he's like oh macho you're a little off balance there and he's like on oh, balance off balance i'm better than you are and he does a lot of those where like he just <laughs> improvises a lot and i think that stuck with us it felt real whereas you could almost see with most of the other guys cameras on here's my moment and i'm going to talk to you he seemed like he just kind of walked in off the street and was doing this stuff I mean, Macho Man is such a beloved figure figure in wrestling history. Obviously, you, you reference your love for him, you know, as a kid. And I think a lot of people love that larger than life person he became. What did you learn throughout this process of writing the book that you didn't know going in? I One thing I didn't know, and you talk about larger than life, and that always is a great description of him, is that he actually wasn't large compared to most of these guys, you know, you know. I was a kid. I was eight years old in, in WrestleMania three, so nine, ten, eleven, twelve for the rest of his big run in WWF. And uh, you know, you don't realize till you're older that like he wasn't a giant. All these other guys that he wrestled with and against were, you know, even Steamboat, you know, was about his size but a little bigger. Um, some, you know, Tito Santana was was an incredible football player, a little bit bigger, a lot, you know, beefier than he was. But other than that, the big names, Big John Stud, Andre the Giant, you know, Hulk Hogan, Ted DiBiase, these guys were 6'2 plus legit, 240 plus, you know, Hulk was 280 and Andre was whatever he listed him as, 375, which probably was not true. But like, they have him there. And so he's, he's in the ring and he's, you realize He's larger than life. It is entirely a created persona. You know, I, I found these old interviews with the guy who did his wardrobes. So he's like, you got to take up space. So when he spins in his arms wide, he's got tassels. So he kind of looks like a wall and he's got the big cowboy hat. So his head looks giant. And, and all the, a lot of the wrestlers I talked to, you know, Paul Roma and Hacks are like, he walked on his tiptoes. We didn't realize it because he was always spinning and moving. But the reason he was always spinning and moving is because if he just stood flat foot next to Hogan or flat foot next to some of these guys, he was giving up four inches or six inches. I mean, he was he was listed as six foot, but you know, maybe he was in the beginning of his career, but probably by the end, all these guys shrank from all the hits and stuff they took. So so the biggest thing to me was that he managed to make that transition to becoming larger in life, but size-wise. Um, and he did get up to 230, 240. He got the muscle on, you know, one way or another. He was a like maniac in the weight room. I mean, absolutely. The stories of him, you know, having his home gym that he wanted to work out and buying houses specifically near gyms that he liked and all these things are, are legendary. But he was not one of these guys who, especially for that era, like biggest guy in his high school, obviously went on the wrestling team, obviously a football player, then used to being looked up as one of the biggest dudes. Randy spent most of his years until his early 20s as like a regular average six foot 180 pound guy. Wow. And the wrestling world seems to be embracing this book. Saw you tweet out 
you're at WrestleCon. You're you're one of the featured guests. You're right up there with the hacksaws, the Jake the Snakes, <laughs> and stuff. How proud does that make you to be a part of all this? It's awesome. You know, it, it's one of those things where, like, you know, I've promoted a, enough books where I I know kind of how it goes, and there's places you want to be, and WrestleMania obviously is the place they want to be. So we're gonna be there. I'm I got my son come with me. It's gonna be amazing. And uh, and then WrestleCon, yeah, it's like. You know, I taught my one of my favorite interviews was with Hacksaw, and um, I, I and now what happens with books, especially now with just the access on social, like I DM'd him, like gonna be there, let's say hi, and he's like, yeah, it's great, and it's like I'm gonna be walking up, and like I wanted to give him a signed copy for being, you know, I was gonna send it to him, but now like I can just roll <laughs> over. It's huge. There's like 200 people and whatever, but I can take a minute, sign a copy, and just go on the side and be like, hey, appreciate that. That I mean. It's an amazing thing to think about to tell a lot of my, my friends who, who are also wrestling fans are like every they keep texting me like all these things come out and they're all wonderful. And it'll be like just picture like nine year old Finkel. Like just every time you think of this picture, <laughs> nine year old, what would nine year old Finkel think? And I'm like, I know it's like it was mentioned on Sports Center this morning. Like all these things that, that you want to happen with the book are resonating. Yeah. Part of it, you know, is picking the right person to, to, to write about. Right. I mean, uh, there's other people. I know people, people would have, uh, you know, have mentioned like, Oh, what about this guy? What about that guy? I'm like, well, Macho's my guy. So that's why I did him. Well, and, and you mentioned again, the, the long process of writing this book and Oh, Hey, WrestleMania 40 seems like a good time for a book to come out. And wrestling has gotten really hot in the time that you've been writing this book. So what have you got, I guess, learned about wrestling fans? You said you've written a bunch of other books about, you know, regular sports fans and baseball, football, basketball, all those sorts of things. What have you learned about wrestling community and the wrestling fans as you've gone through this process and wrestling continues to, to start climbing in popularity? Yeah, I think the, the, the thing you learn is that it's the same as any other sports team, whereas instead of, you know, if you like football, you like football. So people like wrestling, like wrestling. Maybe you're a Patriots fan or a, a Bills fan or whatever. People are fans of Cody Rhodes or LA Knight or, you know, they have their guys. You have your teams who, who you like. And one of the, the coolest parts is I'd mentioned my son, but he, he was nine when I started this, like just getting into wrestling. I'd taken to like one or two shows. And then he watched, you know, because of Peacock and YouTube, like all the WrestleManias with me that mattered for this one, you know, all the YouTube shows of the old Piper's Pit and all the time Elizabeth was announced <laughs> and all of this. So he got to kind of get into it. And, and he, he's been into it now, you know, heavily. He's heavily invested in the Roman Reigns and Rock and Cody and Seth and all these guys. And so it's been really fun to watch him. Uh, that generation, he was exactly my age when I was getting into Macho and, and hope, you know, 20 years from now, he'll feel that way about LA Knights, his, his guy right now, which is great. But um, to, your, to your question about the, the fans and, and the wrestling, like I've learned that it's the exact same thing as like, I'm, you know, I'm a big football, big basketball guy, baseball guy. And like there's the super nerdy dorks who are like, uh, actually, in 1973, it was, a, it was <laughs> April that match happened and it wasn't at the, at the fairgrounds of <laughs> high school. And you're like, OK, right, fine. All right. But then there's also like that's like the 10 percent. Right. And then there's the yeah, 10 yeah, yeah. Of casual fans. But that middle 80 percent just love wrestling and they love the matches. They're not going to worry about like the minutia or uh, I heard this happen from, the, you know, it's just how it is. And same thing with regular sports fans. You know, they'll they'll talk to you about something like actually, um, you know, when Bill Roberts stole that base, it was, uh, uh, you know what I mean? It was like, you know, it's like people don't care. Like most people are OK with being like 80 percent of a super fan. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's that way, but I, I did realize that there are, there's that, like every other sport, there's that little crust of snobbery with some of the, some of the fans and some of the people you talk to. Um, but by and large, it's been awesome. I mean, just reaching out to people, you know, they don't owe you anything. They're just, they're just, they're going through their day and they get a DM from some goofball named John Finkel, who's like, I'm writing this book on Macho Man. I heard that you played baseball with him in high school, or, you know, I heard that, you know, I saw something that you wrote on Facebook three years ago that you met him at a book at a signing for his rap album like do you have a minute like that's how you do this stuff and almost everyone's nice and cool and will give you 15 minutes to tell you their every accounting of the story uh and that's one of the most amazing parts of it you know in, in the world today you can just reach out and people will be like yeah that yeah, was cool yeah, i was there i was at the target for his rap cd <laughs> he got it signed i still have it i'll tell you about the story that stuff's the best for you from the in-ring stuff as you're watching these old manias watching the old matches what's your favorite macho man match my favorite macho man match is actually uh macho versus warrior uh at wrestlemania because it's the one match where um if and i don't know why it is and if you ever go on youtube after this and look it's the one match where he really can't hide his lack of size for somehow with hogan it doesn't bother it doesn't like he doesn't compute 
DiBiase, like all those guys, they, they kind of just, he did his thing. But Ultimate Warrior was my second favorite wrestler at the time. So that was like huge, a huge matchup. And, you know, remember I was all in. So I actually believed in the retirement match that I would never see one of my two favorite wrestlers ever again wrestle. So I was like heavily invested at the time. <laughs> but watching it now, you actually get to see how brilliant Macho Man is in the ring because Warrior is a giant. He, when he's gorilla pressing, he's throwing Macho around like I throw my son around or you throw your younger brother around. And it's probably the, the, the best looking matches for Warrior with the energy and both of them have the speed and the hype. And, and when Warrior's like cursing the, the gods, the tribal gods that Macho won't go down, it's just awesome. And, and again, Macho, you know, loses that. Like he loses all his most famous matches. Um, but that's my favorite. All right, John, before we let you go, you, you mentioned you're going to be out there. It's WrestleMania 40. You mentioned your son. He's into wrestling. Do you guys think Cody Rhodes finishes the story at WrestleMania 40? Oh, I hope so. I really hope so. For the sake of my son and all that generation, you know, <laughs> I don't think this thing with The Rock's amazing. Everything going on is incredible. I'm for all yeah. of it. When it comes to whatever decision they make, I really hope they understand how much like 12 and under kids hate Roman Reigns. Not in the good way. They're bored. They're so bored. Every kid who's 12 has had one champion for three years who never shows up. <laughs> my son, who doesn't know the business, will be like, oh. Smackdown, no, no Roman. Up, oh, up. Oh, I guess it's been a month since like he never fights. Like you have little kids complaining about his like not showing up for work. So just give us Cody. <laughs> I've taken my son to a couple house shows, the one in Miami. They love him. They absolutely that generation is gonna grow up worshiping him like the other kids grew up with Cena or Hogan or whoever the biggest baby face was. Just it's enough. Like let him do another program with <laughs> Roman. And and I, I'm more just so my son doesn't complain. I'm with him though, because you know. It, it is kind of silly when you think how we grew up. I mean, Hogan was the big guy. But after that, the title changed hands fairly regularly. Um, and there was programs and new stories and new angles. So all that is to say, I, I, I am also, he's convinced me. Like, it's enough. Roman's been great. But just dragging it out. And I remember when he fought <laughs> LA Knight at, I think it was Elimination Chamber. As he's walking out, my son's like, oh, what's going to happen? He's going to almost win. And Bloodline's going to come in and cheat. And then he's going to feel like he was robbed. up. And, and I'm like, dude, you're you're... If you're just writing this script, which is exactly what happened, I think they've, they, 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 yes, they uh -huh. jumped the shark at this point. So a lot of words to say, come on, let, let him do it. Let him finally, let us move on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, on the lower third here, are we tired of Roman yet? Brian has had this yeah. just sitting here every once in a while. It comes up during the show. So, yes, <laughs> apparently, yes, John Finkel, tired of Roman Reigns, rooting for Cody Rhodes. The whole Finkel family. Let, we're just going to put all of us out there. All right. <laughs> John, the book is Macho Man, The Untamed, Unbelievable Life of Randy Savage. It starts April 2nd. You can pre-order your now. Uh, John, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Um, really hoping and wishing success on the book. Thank you, guys. This was awesome. I love talking macho. You guys are, you guys are talking my speed. So hopefully uh, we'll catch up soon. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Go on, buy the book. It is Macho Man versus the man. We're, we're a long shot. We don't, we don't have the clout that the man has at the moment. But every book <laughs> like gets us closer and closer to maybe that literary tower power face-off that everybody wants.